Um, hello. Hello. All right, we are going to get started in just a minute. I think that some people, a couple people emailed me like just a minute ago saying they were having trouble um, logging on. So I want to just give it a minute. Maybe we can go over. Um... Zoom rules for those that are here. Uh, yep. So um, I want to just take a minute to make sure that everybody knows how to work with Zoom. Um, I'm going to mute everybody. Um, I, otherwise, there's just too much background noise. Um, but I really am hoping that everybody will be asking questions as we um, go through this, either by posing in the posting in the chat box, which if you're on your computer is at the bottom of the screen. Um, there's a place where you can click on chat and then the chat box will show up um, on your phone. It's also there, but you might have to touch your screen to see it. And you might have to toggle between your screen um, to see who there's different on your phone, there's different um, ways to see multiple people or one person on your phone screen. And likewise, on the computer, um, you can toggle between speaker view or um, gallery view if you look at the upper left hand, right hand corner, sorry. Um, so that is how Zoom works. That's the long and the short of it. Exactly. It's actually um, the short of it. The short of it. So today I see lots of names that I know. So I'm saying hello to everybody that knows they know me. Today we're going to talk about Sarah and I will talk probably for about 15 minutes or so, 15, 20 minutes or so. And then we're going to make sure that there's lots of time for questions and lots of time for discussion at the end, because that was one of the pieces of feedback that we got that people were really um, interested in, in sort of having more of a discussion. So we want to make sure to leave plenty of time for that today. Um, any questions about anything that I've said so far? All right. Do you want to start taping, Rachel? It has already taped. It just automatically stopped, started taping when I popped on. Oh, it's mind reading now. Yes. It's getting to know you. Yes. Um, okay. So I want to start today as we, as I like to start all of these calls by just taking a moment to arrive together and breathe. So you can either close your eyes or focus on something um, sort of in the near mid-range distance and take a minute to inhale and exhale, bringing your attention to your breath. Letting your shoulders drop. Noticing if there's any part of your body that is holding tension allowing it to let go. And as you're breathing, you have two choices. You can count your breath so that they're even. Inhale, inhale for the count of three, exhale for the count of three. Or you can Count so that your exhale is longer than your inhale. So inhale for the count of three and exhale for the count of four or whatever number suits you. So inhale and exhale.
And now take a minute again to check in with your shoulders. with your body, with your breath. Take one more breath. And when you're ready, you can join us. So, I am, again, I am Dr. Rachel Barbanel Freed, and I'm here today um, with all of you and Dr. Sarah Sarkis. Um, and we're going to jump right in. We're going to, for those of you who um, missed the very start, we're going to spend about um, 15, 20 minutes talking. And then we're going to save the chunk of the time, the biggest chunk of the time, to um, have discussion towards the end. So feel free to post questions in the chat box as we're going um, or ask questions as we're going, but we're going to really make sure that there's a lot of time at the end for discussion. All right. Sarah, take it away. Take it away. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, okay, so we're really glad that you guys are here. We said last time, for those of you that have now been here twice, um, that this will be a series of three and potentially four, with each one sort of building on the last. So this is about game day. This is about being a leader in this period of time that is certainly for all of us that are alive and at this place in our career or our life, our community, our family, in any way that you are here identified as a leader, this is unprecedented. None of us have gone through a global pandemic before where virtually all realms of our life have changed in what seemed like it was overnight. So if most of us just think back six weeks ago, um, I know Rachel and I, a month ago, were together in Florida talking to a team of mental health workers about how mindfulness can transform your organization. And go figure, that feels to me like it was six years ago. And a lifetime ago. Oh my God, a lifetime ago. I, it's like almost like it didn't happen. Like we made it up. Um, so this is what is called exponential change. It has exponentially changed in a moment in time. And a lot of times we talk about exponential growth as this real space for significant opportunity, financially, in the markets, with tech, with education. And our general sense, mine and Rachel's sort of general sense about this period of time is that this too holds that same opportunity. But exponential change is volatile and it's slippery because everything is disoriented all at once. So what we really want you guys to have either a growing awareness of, this will largely depend on your own relationship to self-observation, self-awareness and sort of the game of internal change where you are in that game if you've been working with myself or Rachel um, you're you know a certain length into that game if you're here totally new that's great too like welcome and what a perfect time to begin this journey there's no right or wrong time to start but these three principles of self-awareness, observation, and self-regulation come into clear focus during a time like this. So we have four kind of big things we would want you to either continue to think about and observe inside yourself or start. Um, so the first is a sense of belonging. Everything we do and say has been done um, for very thought out and calculated reasons here, a lot of which is related to how, what we know about how the unconscious works. So the reason that Rachel just did that breath work um, is not only because breath work helps us arrive, but a lot of us may have in the span of her doing that, may have had a moment where we thought, 
geez, this is going on kind of a long time. And we did that for a calculated reason, because this is a microcosm. That's a microcosm of what being in your own skin and bones will do to you. You start to rattle up against kind of how you want to operate. What's your modus operandi? What are your unconscious patterns? And so we made a calculated decision in this one to have you really snuggle in to just being here in your own skin and bones with us in this sense of belonging. Belonging starts inside of ourselves. And then we can radiate it as a leadership quality. So first is that you have a sense of belonging. The second is that you have an awareness that this role of belonging and trust plays a critical role in your own organization's health right now. And the role that you as a leader play in facilitating that, it is critical. And we are not talking about this. I have nothing, I should say I, now that I'm gonna say something. <laughs> I won't attach you to this thought right now, Rachel. Um, I have nothing against the more, um, ethereal sense of belonging that people talk about and being part of the universe. And I, I think that's all great. I want to be super clear the lens through which I'm talking about it, which is from a neurochemical and neurobiological standpoint. This is the research out of Dr. Paul Zach's um, Institute. And I think he's out of Claremont in California. Um, he has this great book, called the trust factor. And he really looks at this, what he calls the moral molecule, but in um, pop culture, we call it the cuddle chemical. And it's the role of oxytocin in building a sense of belonging and attachment. It's psychologists speak about it when we speak about the benefits of breastfeeding and the process of becoming maternally and paternally attached to your children. Um, but it's present in breastfeeding, burning man, boondoggles. That's what you're doing. You're leveraging the upside of oxytocin. And it turns out that oxytocin actually activates regions of the brain that compel us to act cooperatively. And so this sense of belonging benefits your organization because you are leveraging our brain chemistry to help your team build cohesive strategies. And right now, the organizations that are going to do the best. Now, I would take right now out of this, but I'm trying to be more moderate in the way that I talk. Normally, it's just loaded with hyperbole. Um, so, but right now, more than ever, this sense of belonging is the key to what we really, really want to emphasize. So first is belonging inside of yourself. Arrive inside your own existence. It's uncomfortable. Welcome to the party. Um, the second is being able to initiate and facilitate that within your organizations. And there's dozens, I could give you hours of research on how that will benefit you from this psychological standpoint that I'm talking about, but also economically and financially. And all of anybody in a leadership position right now is making hard decisions in the realm of finances <clears throat> and economic viability. The third thing we want you to have is an awareness of the role that purpose and your values play in your organization, team, community, family, whatever it is that you're leading. And later on, what Rachel's really going to do is walk you through sort of a curated, um, curated list of tools that we've been long before the pandemic, the things we've been working on with the patients and clients that we see in our practice. We refer to this as the psychological leadership toolkit. And there's, you know, lots of great items. In, I mean, everyone is a gem. So get your pens out. And fourth, um, um, 
or sorry, that is the fourth. That's the fourth one. So the awareness of what your the purpose and the values of your how this pandemic will reveal that, and then the fourth is the psychological toolkit. So those are the four things at the end. Um, and if you have sort of more questions about those, you can write them in on the side. I'm going to turn it over to Rachel in you know less than a minute here. But the last thing we really want to emphasize here is this: is that The, whatever role you're playing in your organization, in your community, this is likely the moment in history that your tenure is going to be based on. This is what it's gonna, going to be judged on, just as the generation before us, for those of us that um, certainly were like either geographically or you know part of the USA impacted by 9-11 or the economic crisis. This is a global one now, so nobody's spared. <clears throat> and this is how you're going to essentially be remembered throughout the time that you led your organization. And we see this much more as an opportunity that it will reveal who you are what your values are, what your purpose is, and the psychological and emotional tools that you had available to you to lead your team and employees and organization through this very, very uncertain time. And the reason it is so revealing is because for most of us, we have these very well-worn ways, present company probably guiltier than anybody else. We have these really well-worn ways that we distract ourselves from ourself. Um, sometimes they're healthy. Accomplishment, success, earning degrees, all those ways sort of lie on the healthier continuum. And then a lot of us struggle at times in our life with ways that are less healthy. Uh, sex, booze, drugs, shopping, eating, not eating, all the other ways that we often try to stay distant from ourselves, And this pandemic has just removed all of that. We are literally stuck in our homes and in our bones left to try to now figure it out. So if some of those corners haven't been tucked in for you, it can be very, very disorienting. But hopefully by the end of this hour, Everybody will feel as though those, the, the elements that are disorienting and disorganizing are actually the space where the most opportunity lies. The absolute most opportunity a lot lies there. And for shrinks like us, this is sort of like, it's like a, grand, a global social, ex, social psychology experiment of which we are subjects. And so the main role is observe, observe, observe. That's the space that you can really access growth here. I'm going to turn it over to Rachel, who's going to have the pleasure of outlining this curated toolkit of ours. If anybody has questions, they can ask now before we move on as well. All right, um, so I'm gonna actually start where, where Sarah left off talking about this idea that we are in a crisis, right? And, and I wanna define what a crisis is because I wanna be a little bit more specific than you know it when you feel it, right? Because this is a global crisis that we're in, but a crisis is any emotionally stressful event or traumatic change that happens in a person's life, right? And it, this is not the only crisis that we've been in, and it's not the only crisis that we will be in the future. And the important thing to remember, as Sarah was saying, is that crisis does not build character. Crisis reveals character. So how you step into your role as a leader is going to be how you are remembered, right? And I think that the one of the pieces that Sarah and I were talking about in preparation for this today um, is that while this has been the biggest 
global crisis, right? It's, it's also been the most amazing, unprecedented example of folks working together, right? So there's tremendous suffering and loss, and there's also amazing examples of global unity, cooperation, empathy, and love. We have both simultaneously. And as leaders, whether it's your family, a small organization, or a huge company, what we really have to remember is that all leadership begins with self-leadership. And one of my favorite definitions of, of leadership is uh, the one that Bill Gates says, a leader is one who empowers others, right? And given the immense uncertainty around coronavirus, coronavirus and all of the pandemic and all of the unknowns that are taking place right now, it's vital that as leaders we're conscious about ways that we show up so that we are dialing down anxiety, not stoking it, right? If you're anxious and stressed, that's going to convey to others. If you know that you want others to be calm, you have to exude calm. There is, and there's and, and aside from the way that we feel, it's also really clear that there's a direct relationship between anxiety level and cognitive abilities. So if you want folks around you to be able to be working, whether it's, you know, cooperatively in your family or on a big multinational organization, like we have to be able to think and we have to be calm in order to do that. So next, what we see about in leadership is that you have to ground yourself in your internal values. Integrity, optimism, community, courage, purpose, compassion, because research shows us that people with high levels of self-certainty, which is a, an awareness of what your own value system is, are much better at maintaining calm in adversity than those people who identify um, with external values, such as professional status, fame, or financial assets, right? It makes sense to me if, if you think about it, right? If you're only interested in chasing the dollar and everything's falling down around you, you don't have an internal compass about what to do next. But if you have a real clear sense of yourself in terms of what your value system is, you can use that to propel you forward. And in fact, research um, at Stanford has found that attitude certainty provides a type of psychological safety net that helps us keep fear in check when we're in uncertain and turbulent times, right? And that means do things like be honest about what you can and cannot estimate. Don't make guarantees that you can't live up to, right? False positivity is going to come across as avoidant and too negative will come across as catastrophic. You want to be real and present. Um, the next, uh, oh, you can want to I add to that? Sure. And with that, what, what Rachel's saying is key. And there's a, there's a sort of, there's an underbelly to that, that we benefit from as leaders, which is that, you're off the hook from having to solve this. You don't have to have the answers. You have to have direction and guidance and ideas, and you have to be able to listen to the people that are bringing ideas to you. But you don't actually have to solve what is happening because of the pandemic. And that's also tied to this component. I mean, you can't know all the answers. We none of us do, right? So yes, don't but we be, often delude ourselves? Oh, for sure, right? One hundred percent. So, so you can't actually know all the answers here. Sometimes we think we do, or we think we're supposed to. But here, it's really clear: nobody has the answers. The only thing you can rely on in these in these moments, in this moment in history, is really your internal value system, and how you utilize that to propel you forward. Right. So in terms of the utilization, having a clear plan, which is detailed as possible, is really important. We talked about this last call in terms of lowering the cognitive load. Right. And you have to, at the same time, maintain a recognition that things are changing. 
right? Um, this is what we call psychological flexibility, right? There's this, this concept of, um, in the business world of um, VUCA, V-U-C-A, volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. And we are in like the, the, the most amazing example of that right now, right? Like this is one that the textbooks and the, and the articles and the movies are going to be written about this for a very long time, right? You need to be flexible. You need to be adaptable. You need to be able to be candid and make difficult choices, right? The nature of crisis is that under the best of circumstances, you only have a tiny bit of opportunity to plan ahead, right? So this is thinking at your, on your feet at its best, right? Um, and you want to make sure that you are really clear in your communication because you don't want to be in a place where you feel that the folks who are who you are leading are being deceived or duped right which leads me into the next um or my next point which is leverage your team you cannot do this alone you need to over invest in communication right with most people really most people working remotely now you need to set up multiple ways new ways to keep in touch right? You need to pay attention as a leader to who is emerging into new leadership roles, recognizing strengths. You need to encourage opinions and recognizing that creative problem solving is a necessity right now. We can't afford to shut people down, right? This is not business as usual. We need to act in unusual ways. Right now, we need to be hearing people's voices more than ever. And again, I think this is true whether you're leading a family, a small organization, a community, or a large organization. We need to take in as much kind of diversity of thought and experience as we can. Next is maintain your boundaries while also trying to be a, a, approachable, right? You wanna be as authentic as possible. Um, which is a hard, um, which is a hard thing to kind of go between, right? How do I maintain boundaries but also be approachable? Um, and the best example I can think of is Andrew Cuomo right now, the governor of New York, who is really doing a great job of saying every day, "This is what we need." He's saying. These are the hard calls. This is what we need. But he's also taking time to, to show his own vulnerability, right? Whether it's by um, talking about the fact that he's getting mad at his dog, right? Because he only lives with his dog and there's no one else to be mad at. Whether it's by naming the law, you know, after his mother or talking about the importance of his kids, right? That's how he gets by it because he is suffering with us. He's in it with us. We see that. Peter Atia did it really well too. You pointed yes. it out. Yes, Peter so Atia. Want to see another example of it? Go to to Peter Atia's um, Instagram and his website. Um, he's doing the same thing, uh, the same concept of very boundaried, but also appropriate hum appropriately human and vulnerable. Right. And a P Peter Atia, if you don't know who he is, is a um, a doctor who. Is he technically a functional medicine guy? I don't actually know. He's actually, I think he would probably call himself a longevity scientist, right? Yeah. So he's, does um, science he's got and a, medicine. And he's got a, he's got a medical practice um, and he does a lot of um, social media posts and he's really a great guy to follow because he's very grounded and not um, a sensationalist. Um, foster connection right? Rally behind a, a shared sense of purpose. Make things fun. Um, Chester Elton, who is a major researcher on gratitude, said thir found that 37% of people say they work harder if they fear losing their jobs. 38% say they work harder when their boss is demanding. But a full 81% of working adults say they work harder when the boss shows appreciation for their work. 
Now I realize the numbers don't add up. They're not my statistics, but it's just um, what I read in a review of his book, right? And, and when asked why all leaders don't lead with gratitude, the answer is because they, they fear it will make them appear weak, right? And what we see is actually people do better when you are more human, right? When you say, look, we're all doing the best we can here, they're going to actually come up they're gonna come to meet you at that point. And, and lastly, you have to anchor yourself what's in what's really important, not only to, your, to you and your own personal values, but to your team. And that is everyone's physical and psychological safety, right? The highest performing teams have one thing in common, and that is psychological safety. That is, and, and by that, I mean the belief that you're not gonna be punished if you make a mistake, right? Studies have shown time and again that psychological safety allows for moderate risk-taking, which means speaking your mind, being creative around problem solving and sticking your, head, your neck out without fear of having it cut off, right? And these are the kinds of behaviors that we see um, leading market breakthroughs, right? These are the kinds of behaviors that we see changing the way that businesses operate. Um, and that, that's sort of my list. And um, that last one I want to drive home is really important. I mean, anybody that goes and reads my blog will sort of probably roll their eyes and say, I know where she's going with this. But um, the role of the, the role of dissension or having voices that are that oppose what your thoughts are that challenge your thinking that person or group of people in your group is one of the key roles you can go and read. I write about it just too much about it um, in group dynamics. And um, that person and those role, those people that are going to fulfill those roles right now, they're going to actually help you steer your brain away. See the brain that's overwhelmed, it wants confirmation because it wants to feel better and feel more regulated and then feel more the code is I want to feel more in control. And so often in these circumstances, we can get ourselves down roads of confirmation bias and all kinds of cognitive biases that are not beneficial. They, they are at best benign. Um, but what we hope is that through the practice of self-awareness and self-observation, what we really hope is that people can start to see this instability as intersections where real innovation in whatever industry it, that you're in is going to come. If you're a teacher, there is, you have a science experiment going on across the globe right now about how education can shift and pupate through this crisis. And this, that same metaphor, it's happening for Rachel and I this very moment as therapists and as um, executive consultants. I can tell you 100%, I would not, my nature is that I would not have come on this platform or I would have come kicking and screaming were it not for the pandemic. And so this type of psychological flexibility and the people on your team who think differently than you right now are some of your best allies. You don't have to decide and rule in everything they say, but they are really, really, really critical. And Rachel and I were thinking, okay, so which we always chat before these calls, um, connect and staying with the theme of connecting. Um, and we were like, okay, so, you know, if we had to give them one takeaway and it always comes down to this, we've been saying this for 20 years together and increasingly in our practices that are not connected and then the part of our business that is, which is develop a mindfulness practice. Todd Herman, who is a psychologist and author, um, who was he was actually suffering from COVID-19, and as a project while he was quarantined, he interviewed, it's a small sample, um, but he interviewed 29 CEOs. He asked them a series of questions, did all this um, quantitative research, and um, he 
discovered these three different types and we can footnote this if people are interested in, uh, and do uh, show notes. Um, but he did this research and he came up with these three types and of the healthiest type was this type called the strategic operator. It's essentially exactly what we've described today, being able to leverage your psychology so that you have this internal architecture that is self-regulated and then you can move forward with purpose, clarity, belonging, trust, and cognitive, you can think straight. Um, and lo and behold, he found that of the, they all, every style is gonna suffer the same financial fates within, you know, within a distribution, right? It's, so this isn't about success in terms of financial outcome, but the leaders that were faring the best, they all had one single thing in common. They had a mindfulness practice. So, so there you, you go. That's our secret. So there you go. There you go. Now we can hang up. That's our secret. But you know, if you've worked with me, you're you know laughing and smiling and thinking, "Oh my God, she's gleeful with her, her, uh, you know, being right right now." And I am. Um, and if you haven't, then good for you. I don't sound like a broken record. Um, you've got to create a practice of sitting in your own skin and bones. It's the thing. Uh, at a different time, we can get into the difference between mindfulness and meditation and all of that jazz. I consider the type of work that I do with clients a form of mindfulness. So it's not meditation unto itself, but it is a, a it's a practice of being still in your own experience of yourself. So um, with that said, do we have questions, comments, people chiming in? There's got to be something out there. I know. I Otherwise, refuse. we're just going to keep talking. I know. And you don't want that. And I don't want that. All right. I'll go then. Uh, Great. Hi. Hi. Um, mindfulness or meditation, um, if it's that successful, as you are saying the statistics, how often would you do it personally? Morning, evening, or whenever you feel like you need it? Okay, so first of all, I want to, I love that you chimed in. You hold a special place in the, in the group's heart right now in, the, in, in assessing our group process. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to I, the other interesting thing that Todd Herman found in this research was that the words that leaders used made the most difference. So that's why I made a point of saying that we were choosing our words really carefully. I want to, on that same vein, I want to amend successful um, because mindfulness and getting mindfulness twisted with our conventional notions of successful can sometimes be slippery for people that are high achieving, present company included. So if I can rephrase that, and then it's just a perfect question, right? Um, I would say just doing it is successful and expect that 80% of the time it's going to feel like a tool of torture, right? But you complete it nonetheless. I've done worse to myself for less returns over and over again in my lifetime. If so, my answer to that is daily. Five to 10 minutes in the morning and five to 10 minutes is, at night is how I um, suggest that people start. If you already have a practice, do it whenever. Now, Rachel has a great way that she just uses breath for a moment and sh you know she'll talk about that it's it's really this is that brian mckenzie work that i talked about or i like how he puts this it's this breath work it is your most primal mode of self-regulation so return to it um i also like the sam harris app everybody that knows me knows i'm partial to that it's called waking up um, so there's lots of ways to do it. And the key is just to do it and stay away from any discussion that you think it's working or not working, successful or not successful, and uh, just keep returning to yourself each day. Right. Do, do whatever works. So, you know, some people, there's a, there's a, 
large, long lineage of people who say meditate in the morning. Um, and, you know, I like to do that because then I, I know I've done it, right? Um, but I can't live my entire life in the morning, which I would if I could. I would get everything done before noon if I could. Um, you know, and so there's whatever works. If it's the evening, great. If it's the morning, great. And as Morgan Morgan put in the chat, I love that, right? You can't OD on mindfulness, right? So there's meditation, there's lots of different kinds of meditation, and then there's the, the act of mindfulness, which is just the practice, right? It's all a practice of being present with yourself in any given moment. Thank you. Thank you. I actually started meditation because I would follow Rachel's Instagram feed and a big chunk of it is about mindfulness and meditation. So that gave me, um, but it felt, Sarah felt to me like you were talking to my brain. Like you knew, like you start and then you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then you go back. Yeah, Yeah. I'm also a patient, right? I, I'm talking to my brain too. Um, So I totally get it, right? We're all more human than otherwise. What would you say to somebody who wants to pr- to use pr- this time to start a new creative project or business? Are people open to hearing from someone new, or is it better to wait and jump in when your idea is fully formed? When this goes back to normal, whatever normal would be, hope that may- yes, makes sense. Um, First of all, hi Rachel. So good I, to see you. So I have, you know, I think if you have a, a I mean. We would not be doing this if we didn't think this was a good time to do this. We've never done this before, right? So I think clearly I'm biased. I think that this is an (laughs) awesome time to start a new project. Um, I have a friend in um, D.C. who um, took an old website name that he had from an unsuccessful business venture and rejiggered it so that he now – is getting, is connecting small businesses with food delivery to folks in DC, which didn't exist two weeks ago and has been super successful in getting the companies, the customers connected. So if you have an idea, go for it. That's my, that's my two cents. No yeah. time like the present. No time like the present. And for a lot of us, while our time has, um, it has an intensity to it, it has slowed down. So the things we typically keep ourselves busy with have been removed and there is this simplicity now. Um, I am finding in that simplicity there is tremendous opportunity to have more time to do a little bit, Rachel, of both of what you're suggesting in here, which is sort of also think it through a little bit more and then strategically think about who it is that you think psychologically, like you're gonna have contacts in your, I'm gonna date myself here, Rolodex. Um, You're gonna have contacts that have a personality style that really want to invest in risk right now. And so I would also urge you to think about who it is you think can actually respond um, with a hell yes in this current time. I'll bet you there's more than you think and you know, maybe not as many as you'd hope right now. But then you've used the time to think through the idea. That's, that's you know, you are revealing yourself to be somebody who is naturally trying to find the innovative space here. So that's great. Don't, um, don't stifle it. And then you'll have something when the, when the dust does settle for the rest of those contacts that maybe are more conservative by nature and there are temperament styles and I know you privately you you and I go way back so if you ever want to talk about sort of personality styles to look for in people that you may have a better hit rate when the waters are really uncertain that's just an easy phone call um so I hope that helps Julia did you have a question you looked like you might be preparing yourself to, to say something um, yeah, thank you, Rachel. Hi, was, hi Sarah. Um, well, Sarah's already answered one of my questions, and I'm trying to figure out how to formulate my 
um, question and why I was really excited to join here because I um, have been a leader of um, within a division of my own. I work for a national nonprofit and um, based in California, and I'm based in California right now. Um, but I'm going through not only this global crisis, but also transitioning into a new position within my organization where I had been leading 50 individuals um, and now going to be working from home and starting a new um, position within our organization and creating my own position and kind of struggling with um, being still being a leader within my organization, but I've kind of hit a wall of um, how I even start creating my new position in this new world and just I've kind of just hit this like blank space mm. and kind of a writer's block right now. Yeah I mean so uh, first of all obviously I have a very different role than you but I think I know internally that intersection where it's almost like it feels too big or nebulous to start best strategy just start and also always look around the corner to see if perfectionism wanting to do it right is getting in the way there is no right there's just doing and you'll course correct because you know i know you personally and you have psychological flexibility um in spades so you'll course correct and um <clears throat> but you know we often have these unconscious barriers that keep us from starting something because we think that we have to we have to roll it out like a red carpet um and then there's tactical strategies and stuff you know you're gonna have to use zoom you're gonna have to use you're gonna have to um try strategies to make the distance irrelevant in the team building um and you know we can really specifically look at some of those strategies rachel's actually got like a bunch that she's um talked me through the other day um but generally sort of you know take it don't think globally about it know that the way it looks right now might not be Although you'll keep elements maybe, but that, you know, it may be radically different in three months. Um, the other, the other thing that I would go back to is like checking in with, you know, I think the perfectionism piece is a really important piece, right? Like don't let the, you know, perfect be get in the way of the good, like just start with something. But I would say check in with yourself about what your values are, like, right? Like what do you want this position to be? What's important for you right now, right? And how can you utilize your skill set to make that happen? Mm, this um, does that does that feel satisfactory to you for now, Julia? Yeah, thanks so much, ladies. Appreciate it. Thanks and reach out us. privately with either one of us, of course, right? To problem solve anything else. Um, Okay, similar vein. Hi, Melissa, by the way. Um, how do you reposition the services you offer without appearing that you are capitalizing on this tragic time? For context, I'm a marketing consultant and finding some clients may be considering consultants like myself as a fractional temporary hire um, as being cold or like, mm, yeah. This is a good question, one that I bump up against a lot. Um, it's actually when Rachel and I started talking about this, doing this, like she and I had a really um, good sort of, we were very aligned that like, we didn't want to seem like we were sort of like, you know, trying to get a, a grab at things that we really wanted to anchor in our values, which are belonging, connecting, and imparting strategies for people right now. Those were our primary goals. Um, so one of the things to do is exactly what Rachel just said, which is, you know, get really clear inside yourself that your purpose and your value during this time has a worth to it. And then you 
will probably shave a bunch of edges off of kind of feeling guilty. I would also, in this scenario, I always like to think about like, if there's any part of this that um, falls like on gender lines, like I'm always curious, is it that more women worry about feeling as though we're trying to like capitalize on something? If you're square inside yourself, that your talent has worth right now to organizations. And that worth can be that, like Rachel just said, the guy that repurposed the website, he needed people. I, I work with somebody who does all my marketing. And I, I see it as a mutually uh, purposeful relationship where she is getting work and I have space to create content. So the worth can be that you are helping businesses who would otherwise go under because they have not repurposed their, their marketing strategies. So try to think of it from a purpose and values driven lens. And I think some of the guilt, um, which is never really a very productive feeling, um, I think some of the guilt may shift. Anything to add to that, Rach? I'm wondering if that's a good answer for you, Melissa. You popped on with your face. So do you have... Oh. Oh, can't hear you. You're, Hold on. you're muted. No, ah. no. No, we can't hear you. And I'm not... You're not muted. For ah. <laughs> Just type it. <laughs> We're going to have to go old school. She's going to have to call us. Son and new puppy. Totally get it. <laughs> Say no more. All right. Okay. Anyone um, else? Yeah. Does anybody else, does anybody else have thoughts, feelings, questions, last minute things that you want to ask about that maybe we didn't cover, by the way? Otherwise, we can, we will I, sort of. I get, think that, you know, one thing. I think that one thing I really want, I, I keep thinking about, and I really hope people will take away from this, is that even in this really trying time, we can find something good, right? I was talking with, Sarah and I were talking, as we often do, and you know, I said one of the things, I think you just said this earlier, like, but one of the best things that come out of all of this Zoom business, right, is that distance is irrelevant. I'm connecting with my friends around the globe just as easily as I'm connecting with people around the corner, right? And it is an opportunity for us to create the brave new world that we want to, right, so that we can shift to paying attention to what is really important and take that with us into whatever comes next, right? Because like that's, that's, I think, the most important thing. There's a lot of people who are saying, oh, you know what? I really realize that I don't like the commute, you know, or I'm really realizing that um, there's a part of, you know, this work that is much more meaningful than I thought, or I really do like my coworkers more than I remember or whatever. And if we can keep our, our, ourselves focused on what we can get out of this in a positive way, then we have like the whole world to gain. So should we close with some breath? Open this open and close like bookends? Sure. If there's no more questions or thoughts or comments or anything. All right, so before I close with breath, I just want to say again, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are going to do another um, two calls, maybe one or two calls or three. We'll see how long this thing lasts and how long this thing lasts. Um, but we're so grateful that you're here and we will be sending out the um, 
an email with the recording. Feel free. I got some questions about this last time. Feel free to share with whomever you think might enjoy it or benefit from it. It's, you know, we're putting it out there because we're hoping to create a space that feels connected and comfortable and helpful for folks. So with that being said, just take a minute again. Maybe this is your second moment of today. And just check in with your breath and take a minute to notice if you feel any different physically from how you felt when you arrived today. And can you notice the shift if there was a shift without judgment? Is there a change in your breath from the beginning of today's meeting to right now? Is there any change in how you are feeling from entering to now exiting? Take one or two more breaths. And then be on your way. Thanks so much for joining us. And Thank you, everybody. We'll see you soon. We'll see everybody soon. Hope everybody feels slightly more connected to yourself and to us, to each other. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Bye. Bye. How do I leave this thing?